Hi, I'm Christina Cohen, SPA President. Welcome to the Van Allen Lecture. Here, we honor one of our own for their significant contributions to the area of magnetospheric physics. Now I will hand you off to Dan Baker, who will introduce this year's honoree. It's my great privilege today to, and my a true honor to be able to introduce the James A. Van Allen Lecture for the Bowie Lecture Series for 2020. The um, selected speaker for today is Robert L. McFerrin. It is, in my opinion, long overdue that Professor McFerrin be recognized in this way and to be able to give the Van Allen Lecture uh, for the American Geophysical Union. Dr. McFerrin was born and raised in the state of Washington. He uh, did his undergraduate work at the University of Washington in Seattle. He was an honor graduate in physics from that program. He then went on to get his master's degree at the University of Southern California. He then went on to get his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, after graduation from Berkeley, Dr. McFerrin was selected um, as a tenure track faculty member at the University of California, Los Angeles. I believe this occurred through the good efforts of the late Professor Paul Coleman, who was building up the UCLA program in space physics. For the subsequent several decades, Professor McFerrin has been an outstanding teacher, researcher, and public servant at the, uh, in the UCLA faculty. Now his work has uh, covered an immense range of topic areas. He's worked in wave, plasma wave studies in the magnetosphere and its environs. He has studied solar wind magnetosphere coupling He's worked on a deeper understanding of geomagnetic storms, and he's done so many other things. In fact, I could spend all my allotted time just talking about the many things that uh, Bob has worked on. I can certainly say that uh, his uh, groundbreaking work in ULF wave studies, the understanding of semi-annual variations of geomagnetic activity, solar wind predictions of the DST and AE index uh, series. Um, and uh, a particularly um, gratifying one for me is the work that he's done in using prediction filter techniques to understand radiation belt science. But in all of this, he's done a marvelous, marvelous job. Now there's something called the McFerrin effect for those who know Bob well, uh, they know that this isn't uh, some subtle ionospheric or magnetospheric things so much as it is uh, something that accompanies Bob. Um, if one rides with Bob in a car, one can pretty much expect that there will be a failed fan belt or perhaps the vehicle will burn to the ground. If you're in a subtropical setting, a region or so, there will probably be a freak snowstorm if you're with Bob. If you're a fine restaurant or so with him, there will probably be a complete power failure so that you can't use your credit card to pay for the meal. So the McFerrin effect is quite a fascinating thing. And uh, I don't know that anyone has fully explained it physically, but it is a, a, a phenomenon that is well known. Um, the picture that you see with this presentation is Bob in uh, doing one of his favorite things, which is hiking and, uh, and exploring the wild country of North America and around the world really. Many of us have had the pleasure and the challenge of walking, hiking, and perhaps camping with Bob, and it's a, a true delight. Let me again say that Bob has uh, done so much for the community. He has been such an outstanding uh, citizen. He's a wonderful mentor. His work has been highly cited, over 15,000 citations to his work in published literature. He has uh, been a great teacher and uh, so many people owe so much to Bob for uh, all that he's done with them and for them. And so it is 
uh, indeed, uh, again, a pleasure for me to be able to um, welcome uh, a friend, a colleague, a mentor, and an outstanding scientist to deliver the 2020 James A. Van Allen lecture in the Bowie lecture, Bowie lecture series. And with that, I give you Dr. Robert L. McFerrin. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to be here at the virtual 2020 AGU meeting to present the Van Allen Lecture. The topic that I chose for this is the subject that you know more about me than any other subject, and that's solar wind coupling and magnetospheric substorm. What I intend to do today is to go through a sequence of slides. Each slide is, uh, has a simple title or a phrase that is a process in the sequence of events that occurred during a magnetic substorm. If you memorize these titles and understand the concepts associated with them, you will be very close to understanding what is Magneto isolated magnetospheric substorm is. What I'm going, uh, just to call your attention to this concept of substorm, it was invented in 1964 by Akasofu when he published the auroral substorm, a time-space description of the auroral uh, activity in the auroral zone. Uh, the word substorm uh, did not gain a lot of traction in the literature until 1982 when the geotail spacecraft was launched to study substorms in the tail. And then the number of cumulative number of citations each year increased rather rapidly until 2007 when the Themis mission was launched and it went, rose even more rapidly. At the present time, we have 7,000 and more papers that reference uh, substorm. And each year we're getting as many as 10,000 citations. That is a very large literature and one that's very difficult to comprehend all of it. When I was a graduate student at Berkeley, uh, working on my thesis, I went to the auroral zone th uh, three years in succession. The first year, 1964, I went accompanied Kinsey Anderson, George Parks, who were flying balloons to measure electron precipitation. I uh, had search coils on the ground measuring magnetic pulsations associated with the aurora. Uh, we were not very successful that year. In 1964, we launched nine balloons and only one got good data. We came back to Berkeley and a paper had been published by Akasofu titled The Auroral Substorm. And it was a description of such a clear description of what we had seen in the auroral zone. Quiet arcs overhead, the equator where most becomes uh, brighter and activated. It uh, expands poleward and uh, as muthily, creating this giant bulge of turbulent aurora overhead. It was so close to what we had seen and written on our chart records that we went back in 1965 with this in mind, and uh, we were able to fly balloons much more wisely and got much better data. We came back uh, that fall, another paper had been published by Akasofu on the polar magnetic substorm. That is the magnetic variation seen on the ground as the auroral substorm was going. At that time in 65, it was co quite controversial. Was it this system A, which was called DP2, disturbance polar of the second type, actually two cell system, as you see here, with a electrojet westward and an electrojet eastward. And it was these that they were thinking caused the magnetic variations on the ground. But an alternative explanation was this one, a single cell system across midnight. What was not realized then is that uh, it was a combination of both of them. My thesis down here at the bottom Relation of auroral zone micropulsations to magnetospheric substorms was 
finished in 1968 because I had to go back a third time to get uh, more data. But the uh, data that I acquired is shown here. This is the typical chart records of the time. I had to hand digitize them so that I could do uh, analysis such as you see over here to get a power spectrum or a dynamic spectrum. But what I found is that there were four types of waves. What these we would call uh, ion cyclotron waves. These are just the turbulence associated with the aurora. These the noise bursts are PI2 pulsations and band limited is what we now call PC3 pulsations. But these four uh, types of waves were seen in relation to substorms. Here is the expansion phase, the first, this dashed line. And what I saw in particular is that noise bursts or PI2 pulsations occurred for about an hour or more before the expansion onset. Well, uh, the, uh, in, as I was writing my thesis, I attended a, a spring meeting of the AGU and I heard a talk by Neil Bryce saying that electron precipitation was just global around the earth during an auroral disturbance at midnight. I came back and talked to my uh, friend Corniti, a fellow graduate student, and he says, yeah, it's obvious. It's not uh, just uh, something happening in the aurora or on the, on, in the ionosphere. It's happening throughout the magnetosphere. So uh, our paper ended with this paragraph. To generalize the concept of the auroral substorm, we, uh, to include all of these disturbances, we suggested magnetospheric substorm. That term was accepted and is now uh, the one that I showed you the graph of citations to. Uh, I was fortunate in getting a position at UCLA and I, uh, my goal at a UCLA was to work with the uh, first geosynchronous magnetometer in, in space and one of the first um, eccentric orbiters that went into the tail, OGO5. And I decided I would start by writing up my results about PI2 pulsations and uh, their relationship, the white line here, to the expansion phase of the substorm. And what I found, and this is taken from my dissertation, is for an hour before, there was increasing probability that you would see a PI2. Wow, that wasn't right. And uh, uh, then after the expansion, it would uh, decrease more rapidly. I, th I saw this as uh, the magnetosphere becoming increasingly unstable and then explosive uh, onset of the auroral expansion. I submitted a paper for publication and two referees uh, looked at it. Two referees rejected the paper. Uh, uh, the editor called me, Alex Dessler, and he said, Bob, one referee will never accept it. The other is open to negotiation. He says, if you uh, reduce this to a brief report and negotiate with that referee, we might be able to publish it. So uh, I did that and the referee said, no way, no way, I'll never accept this concept based on uh, waves that you see on the ground. You've got to show it to me in magnetograms. So I created this uh, very <laughs> sparse array from Finland to College, Alaska of magnetometers. And I found an onset in Hudson Bay, this very sharp onset of a negative perturbation. Uh, uh, and then I sh uh, found out here at Livergor in Iceland that there had been an hour of precursor activity. The referee said, okay, the paper was published and a controversy began that lasted for 15 years. People did not like this idea of a growth phase to the substorm. At the same time as I was working on my thesis, uh, Ken Shatton and John Wilcox at, uh, at Berkeley were working on the factors that are associated with magnetic activity. KP is a uh, crude measure of magnetic activity. It runs from one to nine. And they had found that it depended both on the magnitude of the uh, interplanetary magnetic field and the speed of the solar wind. If you increase uh, uh, at a constant speed, if you increase field, up goes KP. 
And if you uh, uh, do the same, uh, you, uh, uh, at constant magnetic field, increasing velocity, it increases. So both factors were important. If you come over here and examine this plot of the AE index versus uh, the Z component of the magnetic field in the solar wind, uh, you'll see here in the median line, the blue line, that the uh, uh, activity in AE, that's a measure of the strength of those currents I showed you earlier, you'll see that for northward field, there's hardly any activity. But for southward field, the stronger the negative BZ component, the uh, greater the AE index. So the conclusion was, it is something about the Z component of the magnetic field in the solar wind that is controlling magnetic activity. Well, there was reason to, uh, to believe that that might be the case. This is a very important paper written actually in 1961 here by Jim Dungey. And it uh, was an idea that he had to explain how you could get that two-celled uh, current pattern uh, by a process called reconnection, magnetic reconnection. The idea is if you have an interplanetary magnetic field line in the solar wind that's pointing in the opposite direction to the Earth's field line uh, on the day side, that it'll be pressed against the uh, day side current sheet. And uh, if it gets thin enough, a process can occur at a neutral point, that is a place where the magnetic field strength is zero. You can rechange the configuration such that it's no longer a closed loop of field, but it's open and connected to the solar wind. The solar wind carries that field over into the tail and then eventually presses it together at another neutral line in the tail and it returns on each side of the earth and you get that two cell pattern. This process of magnetic reconnection was extremely controversial in those days and uh, people argued all the time about it. That led Chris Russell and I to uh, discuss something that is now called the Russell McFerrin effect. But in, at that time, it was well known that uh, magnetic activity was a maximum on the equinoxes. So here in spring and here in fall. Uh, Chris recognized that um, that could be accounted for by the geometry of the Earth's rotation axis, dipole axis, and the position of the Earth around the sun. And in particular, it, uh, as, as the Earth goes around the sun, the um, dipole axis gets more and more tilted towards the ecliptic plane. Uh, and that results in a larger projection of the azimuthal component onto the Z direction. And so we took just the southward component of that, which is what you'd expect for reconnection to be occurring, and we showed that you'd expect equinoctial peaks, as you see here, uh, in spring at 22, here uh, in fall at 10. And when we went to look at the actual data, that's exactly what is seen. The solar wind behaves exactly as we said it was, perhaps with a little less strength than we argued. But nonetheless, you see this pattern of peaks uh, at the appropriate times and of year and day. So we argued that this was support for the concept of magnetic reconnection. Well, uh, this, uh, after I got to UCLA, uh, my colleague Chris Russell and Margaret Kibbleson were working with Michelle Aubry on an inward pass of the um, OGO spacecraft through the dayside magnetopause. And the spacecraft was coming in, but the magnetopause kept getting ahead of it and then fall behind, get ahead of it and fall behind. And they real, uh, the dynamic pressure of the solar wind wasn't changing. The only thing that was happening was the field was southward. And they said, aha, the magnetic reconnection process is stripping magnetic field lines off the day side and carrying them in the solar wind, like this red line, to the night side. <coughs> <clears throat> 
Of course, there's magnetic field lines flowing into the reconnection site on the inside. But if they don't flow in as rapidly as the solar wind brings them up, you get erosion. But uh, the dashed line shows an important consequence of erosion, and that is it uh, brings the magnetopause closer to the Earth and changes the flaring angle uh, in the near-Earth region to be steeper than it was before. But that means that the effect of dynamic pressure hitting the uh, magnetopause is stronger. That requires that the magnetic field on the inside get larger in order to stand off this increased dynamic pressure. So that would mean that the uh, magnetic field in the lobe in this region would increase in strength with time because, and of course that required a current down here in the current sheet, in the plasma sheet that was closer and stronger than it was before. Further from the earth, nothing happens other than the uh, magnetopause gets uh, a larger in diameter as you put more flux into it. This concept of erosion and flaring is a consequence of uh, reconnection. The idea of flux transport is shown here. And the idea is you merge uh, on the day side, you transport it over the polar caps, actually both polar caps, to the tail, it reconnects in the tail, and then it's returned to the day side around both the dawn and dusk uh, flanks. If all of these rates of uh, flux transport are identical, you have a uh, stable system. Everything's in equilibrium. And so uh, nothing uh, would change, although things are moving around in the magnetosphere. However, there's no reason to believe that if it's, if it's been quiet and you suddenly turn on merging here, that reconnection will immediately start in the tail and be balanced. So therefore, you expect that uh, the erosion process will transport flux to the tail and cause uh, increase in B here and increase in diameter back here. By the way, it also causes an additional pressure on the plasma sheet. Uh, the magnetic pressure of the field causes it begin to thin. So we would expect a sequence of changes in the magnetic field as a consequence of the delay in uh, uh, night side reconnection relative to day side. We, uh, one of my first students, uh, used that Ogle 5 spacecraft to study the energy density in the near Earth tail region. Um, I think this is 10 and this is 20 uh, Earth radii behind the Earth. As, and during this growth phase that I had introduced, we found that the, uh, there was a uh, significant increase in the energy density in the tail prior to this vertical line, which is the onset of an auroral expansion. Now, in those times, it was determined by mid-latitude positive bays, and I'll return to that and what they mean. It's a positive perturbation at mid-latitudes. But uh, then there was a rapid unloading. So we call this the concept of loading magnetic flux into the tail, lobes, storing it, uh, and then subsequently unloading that energy and driving the expansion phase of an auroral substorm. Over here, you see in the BZ component, the changes in, uh, uh, with time, and the field becomes more and more parallel to the equatorial plane as you approach uh, the expansion onset, and then a sudden um, uh, increase again uh, as it rotates back to a more dipolar configuration. So this concept of loading and unloading became a central feature in our understanding of the substorm. Uh, it was a quite controversial, just like the growth phase was controversial. And I started a, uh, d doing analysis at that time using uh, uh, this, uh, basically transfer function analysis for an electronic system. But the idea is you have an input and you have an output. And if you suddenly put in a pulse, you'll get an impulse response. Well, that's what I've calculated here. And what I'm showing you uh, on a three hour time scale here, this is the um, 
uh, the t equals zero, lag equals zero. So at lag equals zero, not much happens uh, in the magnetosphere. In terms of field aligned current, this is a very complicated uh, measurement of, of field line currents that are going up and down uh, in the magnetosphere. The red line is on the day side, the blue line is on the night side. And what we're seeing is the response function starts earlier to rise on the day side, which you'd expect because that's where the solar wind starts reconnection and then decays away on the night side. And it's delayed and offset uh, here. But what's very interesting is to look at the prediction efficiency of the solar wind coupling function, which is basically that the product of V and B south. Uh, uh, you see 73% of the variance uh, in, on the night side in the upward current is explainable by the solar wind coupling. That certainly sounds like the solar wind is driving activity. But yet, we also showed that energy was being stored in the lobes and being unloaded. So the question is, uh, which of these processes is dominant? Over here on the right-hand side, these were field line currents. Uh, these, this is the relation of those field line currents to the index, the AL index, which measures the strength of those currents. It's peaked at zero which means that um, they're one-to-one -one relationship uh, uh, and that these currents, the field line currents, are actually feeding into these, those aur auroral electrojets. Again, 72% of the variance on the night side. Our measurements are not that good of the input or the output. So uh, to be able to predict 72% of the variance by the, uh, the solar wind suggests that somehow the reconnection process, certainly on the day side is driven, but it also suggests it may be driven on the night side as well. A, th uh, a process that occurs, I, may, I alluded to a moment ago is the compression of the plasma sheet by the uh, increased magnetic field that has been loaded into the tail. And uh, the OGO-5 uh, spacecraft saw in electrons and protons that there were often dropouts of those particles during substorm growth phases. Uh, here it's quiet, here you see uh, expansions and so on. Those particles would drop out in the growth phase and reappear in the expansion phase like there or there. And they what they concluded is that the uh, pla uh, plasma sheet was growing thin, thinner with time. And that meant, of course, that the current sheet in the tail was growing thinner with time. Later, I, wor I uh, worked with Nishida in, uh, uh, on uh, analysis of icy data. And what we, uh, we had a very fortuitous situation in which the plasma sheet swept across the spacecraft in such a manner that we were able to, first we were above it, this is the uh, position of the, of the sheet relative to the spacecraft, uh, and then we were below it. Um, at any rate, what we saw is when the field was northward, it was about five, half thickness was five Earth radii. And then as uh, the field turned southward, we found that the half thickness went down, down, down to less than an Earth radius. And this was the expansion onset of the uh, substorm. So in other words, you transport flux to the tail, load the lobes, squeeze the plasma sheet. And in addition, in order to provide closed field lines to the day side uh, uh, to uh, support reconnection, you draw plasma close field lines out of the inner edge of the plasma sheet. Both contribute to the collapse of the plasma sheet and its thinning. But it's thinning a thin current sheet that is necessary for reconnection to occur. Another consequence of all of this is earthward motion of the tail current. I, I, I pointed out that as the magnetic, this is the synchronous satellite ATS-6, midnight's here at 6 UT. Uh, you, here you see the field strength increasing, suggesting that we're loading the tail. Simultaneously, you see that the radial component of the field at synchronous orbit is becoming more and more negative. Uh, uh, while the, the vertical component, that's the component parallel to the Earth's dipole axis, 
is decreasing. That's a rotation from a dipole-like field line to a tail-like field line. So um, obviously that says that there's an earthward motion of the tail current to uh, provide the current necessary to support the magnetic field above. And also it turns out to balance the forces on the tail. The solar wind is pulling harder on the outside. So the uh, uh, earth has to pull on the inside to uh, keep it in balance. And it does that by increasing the gradient of the tail field at the uh, dipole location. Notice this. At expansion onset, there's a positive perturbation pre-midnight, remember midnight six, and a negative perturbation post-midnight. That's important because it's being seen at 6.6 .6 Earth radii. I'll come back to that in a minute. This is a complicated diagram. Uh, you can't see over here, but the cluster spacecraft, four of them, are located uh, back here at 20 Earth radii near midnight. And these are the observations over here. The top panel has the plasma pressure, blue, the uh, magnetic pressure, red, and black is the total pressure. And sure enough, the total pressure in the plasma sheet is assumed to be equal to the total pressure in the lobes. So this is an example of loading of uh, energy into the tail and then a fast unloading right here. By the way, it starts to unload a few minutes earlier than the observed expansion onset in the auroral zone. So uh, we would argue that unloading is being accomplished by reconnection and that reconnection starts before you see effects in the uh, ionosphere and the auroral zone. Associated with this unloading was a very, very intense tailward flow, minus 500 kilometers per second, of a plasma and associated with that down here in the BZ component, the magnetic field was pointed southward. If you uh, take that original drawing of uh, Dungey, uh, you will find that's exactly what you s expect on the tailward side of an X line. Then you notice there was a sudden reversal in the direction of flow to become earthward and uh, positive uh, BZ. Um, that's exactly also what you expect on the earthward side of an X line. For this to uh, happen at a fixed point in space, it means that the X line or the neutral line or the reconnection site has moved tailward over the spacecraft. Over here are um, vectors that represent blue, the magnetic field, red, field line current, and black, the flow. When you see current along a field line, you know that this is what's called a flexural. It's a helical structure of field lines that are linked to the solar wind and also to the earth. And so the reconnection site is pretty complicated mess of magnetic field lines. Here in the next uh, image, you see the very strong tailward flow that I pointed out and then it's weakening and suddenly it reverses and it's uh, now earthward, which is at the top of the diagram here. So this is an example of the onset of reconnection, loading and reconnection in the tail uh, 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 associated with both tailward flows and earthward flows. One of our former students, Jim Slavin and his colleagues uh, then at uh, Goddard, uh, studied this intensely with the IC3 spacecraft deep down in the tail. And what they saw during, uh, after a substorm expansion onset was uh, that they would be sitting up here in the tail, let's say uh, on this line A or so, uh, and they, the magnetic observations, the field strength would go up and then it would go down the field direction would tilt upward and then downward, and then it'd go back. They interpreted that as this um, rope-like structure going by underneath them, tilting the field up, compressing it against the magnetopause and coming back down. They called those traveling compression regions and they were examples of a flux rope being dragged out of the tail by the solar wind after reconnection near the earth had established it. 
they use statistical studies uh, of uh, the uh, times of arrival of these relative to expansion onsets in the aural zone, and they concluded that these were uh, released at expansion onset uh, uh, at around 20 to 30 Earth radii. So not far behind the Earth, that's halfway to the moon. This is an example with more recent data uh, taken from the Themis spacecraft. There's, there were five of them. Three uh, had apogees close to the Earth at 11 Earth radii, and the others were further out. Let's start with V and BZ. Um, v is the flow velocity of the plasma. Now we're on the earthward side of an X line, and, and you see strong, positive uh, earthward flow. And associated with it is the arrival of magnetic flux. Fast flow, magnetic flux. The, uh, these events, this is tail-like development of field, this is more dipolar, so these are called dipolarization events. But uh, in general, you see uh, tail-like development, dipolarization, fast flow. And each one of these uh, dipolarization events has a fast flow associated with some larger and some smaller than others. If you look at the distribution of these, they're all at midnight or just earlier than midnight, exactly where the auroral substorm is seen in the auroral zone. Here I show the solar wind electric field in a superposed epoch analysis where T equals zero is the arrival time uh, of the fast flow. And you see that the uh, interplanetary field had turned southward and uh, there was an interval of strong south or uh, electric field associated with this southward BZ. If you come over here to the AL index, you see that about an hour prior to the arrival of the first fast flow, that's the growth phase, there's a decrease of about 100 nanotesla in the AL index. That's the currents that are flowing in the auroral zone in that two-celled system. Then there's a sudden onset here of the expansion phase and down into a negative bay that lasts, it takes about 15 minutes to drop, uh, you get the expansion phase of aurora. So uh, the, uh, the, the conclusion here is that reconnection creates a fast earthward flow that carries newly closed magnetic flux to the inner region where it piles up a tenor uh, so Earth radii, and of course, other things happen in that region of the pileup. Here is a very complex slide. The, the important thing to notice first is that every vertical line is an auroral expansion phase onset determined from all sky cameras across northern Canada. Uh, this is an extremely well-studied uh, substorm uh, that we've just published uh, this year uh, in terms of the data. Uh, the top channel is coupling, then the AL index near midnight measuring the strength of that westward current. These are amplitude of PI2s at Fredericksburg in Virginia and Boulder, Colorado. When a fast flow hits the night side of the earth, it sends waves down field lines and they uh, eventually stimulate magnetic pulsations at mid latitudes. Associated with these uh, fast flows that are coming in, and I'll show you that in a moment, are increases in auroral luminosity. Here, here, and here, and here, and so on. And now here are the, um, observations by Themis of fast flows, three different spacecraft, and uh, each one of these fast flows is associated with dipolarization. In other words, the flows are bringing magnetic flux to the outer part of the Earth's magnetic field, and it's causing an auroral expansion, a very sharp increase in the luminosity of the aurora and all these waves on the ground. Notice this one, very a relatively weak flow and a relatively weak dipolarization, then a much stronger dipolarization associated with stronger flow. I'd just like to give you one sample of the aurora associated with it. This is, this is called a keogram. It's a magnetic, sorry, it's a, a, a plot in magnetic latitude versus universal time of the intensity of the aurora at different points on a line passing magnetically north-south along the uh, 
uh, zenith of the uh, all sky camera. And it's very interesting to notice well, you can see these auroral intensifications. This is that weak one I just pointed out. And because it doesn't expand very far, we call it a pseudo breakup. Uh, and then it uh, re quieted down. And then we had another intensification that went at least five degrees poleward. That's the, um, the meridian view of an auroral expansion. But what's interesting here is that prior to the uh, auroral um, brightening and expansion are these equatorward motions of a quiet growth phase arc, two and three and so on. Um, and this is attributed to the increase in magnetic flux in the lobes of the tail, which of course map down to the earth. And uh, that means that the size of the polar cap is increasing with time. Uh, uh, the other thing to notice is the sky poleward of these growth phase arcs is pretty much a void of any auroral activity. I'll return to that idea later. Now, I've been talking about the magnetic perturbations that we're seeing at mid-latitudes, the positive bay. Here, as a function of local time, midnight, zero, zero, in the dashed line is the magnetic perturbation you see in the north component of the magnetic field. This is say at Fredericksburg or Boulder, Colorado. Uh, you will see a positive perturbation in this case, uh, in this one as almost 60 nanotesla. It's a big one, a uh, big change. And uh, in the east component, you'll see a positive perturbation pre-midnight and a, a negative perturbation post-midnight. So the question is what causes this uh, particular pattern at mid-latitudes of magnetic variation. We proposed early on back in 1973 that it was a diversion of tail current along magnetic field lines through westward through the ionosphere, back out into space, and then completing the circuit. And the, uh, 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 if you look at it from a polar view, and uh, say the diversion of current here is actually an equivalent oppositely directed eastward current, uh, then it looks wedge shaped. So we call this the substorm current wedge. Now uh, I'm going to return to this idea, but what is it that can cause this aurora uh, current wedge? In order, there are only three mechanisms known for creating field line current and they involve a distortion of the magnetic field and plasma in this region of space, uh, a, uh, a bending of the field lines uh, as mucilage due to deflection of flows uh, and deceleration of flows. So deceleration, bending, and a distortion of the field here. In particular, if you deliver a lot of magnetic flux into this region, you uh, make the field lines more dipolar. And the consequence is that the drift of particles that create this current is slower. That current that's flowing here on either side has to be continuous. And because it's been, um, uh, it's, it has to be diverted along the field lines. So deceleration, bending, and the actual work is a cross gradients of flux tube volume and plasma pressure, but it's easier to think of it in terms of just the drift of particles. Uh, this is an example, again, with midnight at six from ATS six that shows when you have these dipolarization events, you have a positive perturbation pre-midnight and hidden here is a negative perturbation post-midnight. So, uh, this is called dipolarization of the synchronous field, and it's uh, associated with the auroral expansion onset. Another thing that has been studied by uh, uh, Byrne and others at Los Alamos is the dispersionless injection of particles at synchronous orbit. While my magnetic field variations were doing what I just showed you, particles are suddenly arriving, and it turns out in a certain region near midnight, 
both electrons and protons arrive simultaneously at all energies. That's hard to believe because if, if they were energized somewhere else in the magnetosphere, they will drift at a rate dependent on their energy. And so they will be dispersed when they arrive here. Dispersionless injection in this region. But what is this region? I just showed you a moment ago. It's the region in which the fast flows are decelerated, deflected, and build up this bubble of plasma and magnetic field on the night side. Apparently what is happening is those flow channels are trapping particles in them and energizing them and transporting them into synchronous orbit. And it is these particles, of course, as they drift away uh, and in the midnight region that create the aurora because they go down, hit the atmosphere and make the beautiful patterns that we see. So let me summarize that I have been talking about a sequence of processes in an isolated substorm. In the growth phase, we have an increase in solar wind coupling. That means a southward turning. We have the onset of day side uh, reconnection of magnetic fields. That leads to magnetic, magnetopause erosion and flaring of the magnetopause. The flux, uh, flux that has been cut uh, on the day side is transported over the polar caps and into the tail lobes and pressed down inward, increasing the magnetic field strength close to the earth and uh, enlarging the tail far from the earth. And we call this uh, behavior in the nearest region lobe loading. Uh, and it, in, in essence, it's a storage of energy in the magnetic field of the tail. Uh, the, uh, the need for plasma close field lines on the day side sucks uh, close field lines out of the inner edge of the plasma sheet and the magnetic pressure of this additional uh, field above causes the field, uh, the current sheet to thin. Uh, it also extends earthward, uh, as I said, to account for the magnetic field uh, stronger above it and to balance forces. At expansion phase, we believe that number one thing is the tail has, current sheet is thin to the point that tail reconnection can begin. And then we have earthward flows and tailward flows. We see that as a plasmoid or flux rope ejection uh, uh, down the tail as a bursty bulk flow coming earthward transporting magnetic flux. That flux and plasma are accumulated uh, near midnight on the outside of the magnetosphere and alter the current configuration across the tail such that a, a, substorm, a current wedge begins to form. It flows across the night side region, uh, midnight region, creating with its field line currents, the mid-latitude effects and uh, by its westward closure, the auroral zone effects. The particles that are transported and energized are being precipitated into the ionosphere. And it turns out that <clears throat> if you put magnetic flux inside a fixed point inside, uh, in the equatorial plane, as is happening in these fast flow events, you will alter the mapping of that point into the auroral zone in such a way that a point that was a, a, a eventually quite equatorward moves poleward. So it's a possible way of a pl explaining part of the poleward expansion of the aurora. As time goes on, uh, these effects, deceleration, deflection, and accumulation of plasma and flux creates the current wedge uh, and all the effects seen in synchronous field dipolarization. And of course, it was the particles injection uh, that are uh, by the fast flows that are producing aurora. There's a fly in this ointment. Um, we uh, subsequently wrote a paper uh, using an MHD simulation of the data that I showed you a moment ago. And this is the equatorial plane uh, from the Earth to 70 Earth radii, and the moon is down in here. Um, of, and red shows fast earthward flows, blue shows fast tailward flows, and the yellow ropes show X lines. Uh, these are reconnection sites. In this particular image at four o'clock, there are five reconnection sites. And there are at least one, two, three, four, five, depending on how you count, fast earthward flows. 
This is 40 minutes before the onset of uh, the major substorm expansion. And during the time interval in which I pointed out to you in that keogram that the, uh, 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 the auroral zone was uh, devoid of much in the way of auroral activity, poleward of that growth phase arc as it moved equatorward. Yet here it says, that uh, we're uh, getting continuous reconnection and multiple reconnection sites. Uh, and in fact, during this entire simulation for eight hours, there was never a time there weren't multiple X lines and multiple fast flows. However, the only substorms we saw, you know, uh, simulated substorms through the magnetic indices that we simulated, uh, occurred when the reconnection rate was so, and the flows were so fast that we accumulated energy in this region. So uh, there's a discrepancy there. But let me uh, end with my outstanding questions. Why is the expansion onset time and location so unpredictable? Why is so much of the AL index variance predictable by the solar wind when we thought of it as a loading unloading process? Why are onset indicators not precise or sometimes missing? Why are auroral signatures of fast flows at onset hard to find? People have used this as evidence that this can't possibly be true because the aurora often breaks up and you don't see any evidence of that fast flow coming in in the aurora. If you have spacecraft out there, you see it. If you have a magnetometer measuring uh, pulsations, you see it in PI2 because fast flows create PI2. Uh, and we see those at X onset, but we don't see the auroral evidence of them. Does the fast flow at onset trigger some plasma instability, as many think, uh, in this inner region? Is the plasma sheet truly inactive during the growth phase, as I said, or is it just that we're not seeing it somehow because of mapping issues or distribution of storms? Why does the X line statistically form on the dusk side of the magneto tail at about 22 Earth radii? Why do simulations indicate reconnection is continuously present? There are still outstanding questions related to the sequence of events, even in isolated substorms. Continuous activity uh, is even more complex. And so much remains to be done. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for checking in with me. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Sorry, as often happens with uh, these virtual things, I was on mute and talking. So my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob, for a great talk. Um, I also want to say for those of you that are uh, not seeing us in, in live in person, uh, I just want to mention that uh, Bob and I had some issues with our, uh, our video connection. So uh, don't take his austere uh, face for uh, any indication that he's not enjoying himself. So we have a number of Q&A questions, and we'll just start right off here. Um, from Krishna Bark wants to know, is it always true that deep polarization fronts are associated with high speed plasma flows? I, ca I can't answer that question statistically, but it's certainly, that's what you would expect as a fast flow plows through the uh, stagnant plasma head that you're going to compress the field and that uh, that in turn will create a current sheet uh, in front of the uh, um, fast flow. So I, I believe that it's a true statement. Okay, and here's one I particularly like uh, from Chris Gilley said, what would you say to a lay person who is concerned about the G3 forecast for tomorrow? <laughs> the, the which? G3? Yeah, that's what it says. <laughs> I assume that geomagnetic storm, I assume this is coming from NOAA, NOAA's oh. forecast of a level three geomagnetic storm. Uh, well, <laughs> I'd say 
you should start reading the dystopian scientific literature, uh, science fiction literature, uh, because that's the end of civilization as far as they're concerned. Uh, no, <laughs> the, uh, magnetic storms do cause significant effects, as we know, in radio communications and uh, uh, utility lines and uh, corrosion of pipelines and things like that. Uh, so uh, it's it's a matter of concern, and that's why NOAA and the Space Weather Forecast Center has such a large list of people that receive uh, immediate warnings when uh, activity begins to start up. I, sh I should mention that the isolated substorm that I talked about in this lecture is not typically what happens during very disturbed times in the main phase of the magnetic storm. It becomes almost impossible to separate out these dis uh, different processes. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, so Jeff Reeves asked, um, the aurora expansion phase lasts much longer than the particle injection and field depolarization. Any thoughts as to why? And he also mentions that he uh, thought you had a great talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, you want to know why the, uh, um, the, the actual expansion phase is about 15 minutes. The duration of the uh, um, mid-latitude positive bay is more like an hour or more. And uh, this is a question of how long does it you create a situation near midnight that is driving this field line current system, and it's, it's a, a distribution of these particles that are going to drift away. And it takes a certain length of time for that to happen and to di dissipate the source mechanism, but it also is a question of dissipation of the energy in the ionosphere. Uh, so I, I see this as simply the decay time. Remember, there are certain time constants associated with the induction of the self-induction of the field lines and the resistance of the ionosphere. So you build up a situation that takes a certain length of time for that to be dissipated uh, through the resistance of the ionosphere. And 20 minutes is a fairly uh, typical time constant, e-folding time. Yes, go ahead. Hey, great. All right, uh, so Marissa uh, Headland wants to know, how frequently are depolarizations observed not near the geosynchronous or midnight? Well, unfortunately, from my point of view, I can't answer it because I've only looked at 10 or 11 Earth radii. I haven't looked further out. But uh, what we know is that substorms occur typically five times a day. And they're uh, uh, statistically three hours long. So, you know, about half the time uh, uh, on, in averaging, uh, we're having a substorm in progress. What was the question again? <laughs> he wanted, uh, she wanted to know how frequently are depolarizations observed not near geosynchronous or midnight? Oh, no, no, all the time. I mean, every fast flow that comes in. Uh, in fact, the word dipolarization was originally uh, meant to be the rotation of the uh, synchronous field back to a more dipolar configuration. It then was expanded uh, to mean the expansion tailward of, uh, of this uh, region of disturbance. And then it uh, became the leading edge of these fast flows is called a dipolarization front. So you have to be very careful in the literature about which they're talking about. The front, <laughs> as I meant, is uh, when these flows come in and then they begin to spread out as mucilage, you have a, a dipolarization front that's going as mucilage as, as well. So it's used in a variety of ways. And By the way, it's dipolarization. <laughs> um, so then we have a uh, question from Tulia uh, Pulkinen who asks, "What measurement do you think would be best? That sorry, what measurement do you think would best advance our understanding of solar wind magnetosphere coupling?" I would like to see a. Uh, circular orbit at 17 Earth ready, polar orbit uh, with maybe four spacecraft in it, like uh, the Vela were at one time. 
and with magnetometers and plasma sensors. That would uh, eliminate one of the major sources of errors in our input to the system, which is the propagation from 250 Earth radii. If we could do it just outside the, uh, uh, the bow shock, it would be better. Well, uh, great. So that's, Thank you. That would be, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, that would well, be the gonna... uh, first thing I'd do. And the, uh, but for substorms in general, we've got to have a, a number of spacecrafts uh, spread out across the night side uh, so that we can see how many of these flows are actually penetrating to the inner region. So there. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up here. Um, Bob, I hope you do take some time to, uh, if you haven't already, to glance through the ch chat. There's lots of... Uh, Congratulatory mes messages as well as uh, claims of that you gave a great talk, which I agree with. And so I wanted to just thank everybody, all the audience, for attending our Van Allen lecture and to again congratulate Bob on this well-deserved honor. And um, for those of you that have asked, these um, this presentation should be able to be viewed later um, on the AGU platform. And I uh, hope everybody has a good either rest of their day, night, afternoon, whichever time zone you happen to be in. Thanks again, Bob. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>